We'll now have a session of questions and discussions. So please raise your hands and yes. yes. I thank you very much for this uh, very interesting report. But uh, for me, it still remains uh, unclear how can we compute from logical structures to actual being. Well, I, I, here's what I've said, that Quine once said you are not allowed to contribute to, to what you quantify. I think that's perhaps a misleading way of putting it. I think one way is to say, Quine will say, I hear philosophers talking about being and what really exists, and I don't really understand it. So I've got a new method. I, I can tell you what we quantify. If you have some different sense of real being or real whatever, all right, fine. But for those of us who don't understand what these questions about real being are, I've given you a question that I think we can answer. So I'm, I'm suggesting that it's, that in a sense, I don't want to buy into the, I don't want to present it by saying, look, we all know what real being is, and Quine says you can get to it via quantification. I want to say, look, we may have some idea about real being is, but I'm not sure that we really know what we mean, what we philosophers really mean by it. So how can I say to you, all right, if you're the sort of philosopher who doesn't really know what we mean by that, I've got a trick for you. Take a lot of ordinary non-philosophical sentences, systematize their logical structure, see if you can find quantificational structure. And if these, are, if these are all true sentences and you need that logical structure to see them, that's good enough for me. And if you have some deeper notion of being, well, yes, okay. What are the real existing uh, entities? Are they uh, the values of uh, variables? Or are they uh, the semantics of Quantifiers. Well, they, they will be, perhaps what the best thing to say is, look, I'm, I'm giving you tests for saying, here's what a language must look like if it has quantificational structure. And when it has quantif quantificational structure, we express it using first order language. We then also find that that structure can be expressed by a meta-language in which we have a domain of individuals and we do all these things. Um, I like Carnap's idea to say that in doing this we have adopted a framework. We have, adopted, we, have, we, have, we have agreed to talk to each other in this kind of way. And we know how to do it, I can show you how to do it, and this is, this is, this is how we do it. Now, if you want to, and to justify it, we say, well, look, I find that when I do this, when we, when we talk this way, when we formalize it, when we then, we, when we then describe the formalization in the meta-language, which is just doing the same thing one little up, and then if somebody says, well, how do I understand the meta-language? There are two replies. One is, well, you just do, don't you? Or if you really don't, we go to a better meta-language and so on. We do this. This is an activity we find it profitable. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to speak for Kana here, but one way is to say, look, it's not, the world has an input. I mean, it, we, we are in a world that cooperates. When, 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 we, when we do this, when we engage in this linguistic activity, we find that the world cooperates with it. So it's not, it's not as if all this is just made up because the world might not have cooperated. It might have been that it might have been, I mean, we adopt in in most of our human concerns, we adopt a thin language. It's not it's not obvious how good a thin language because people have talked about rainbows. When when does one rainbow different from another? But when we use language, when we formalize it, we really adopt it as if it was a thin language. And one reason why I suspect that philosophers have made no progress on the uh, issue of vagueness is that I think that the world only partially cooperates with its students. That, that things like vagueness, you, I don't know, I, mean, I, I, I know of all the 
four or five different ways in which philosophers have tried to say what vagueness is. I don't believe any of them works, and I think that doesn't work because I believe that the, the semantic framework that natural language imposes on us actually pretends that the world is more precise, if you like, than it is. But nevertheless, we get by. And so the world cooperates with us enough that the kind of semantics and therefore the kind of ontology that we read off from it, the kind of ontology is an ontology which the world cooperates with us about. And now, if you like, that's perhaps taking a metaphysical or anti-metaphysical stance. Yeah, thank you. Yes, another question? Um, I've got a question concerning, for example, your uh, sentence number 10. Mm -hmm. Because your sentence number 10 is just a clear example of what I'm going to ask about. And this is namely that there is presumably always a risk that a particular way of expressing things is already infected with some metaphysics and not a metaphysics in, innate to the language itself, but just normal metaphysics common to the philosophical community. Because, for example, this way of putting this, there is a world in which is quite clearly influenced by some metaphysics, by some philosophy, by some academic activity. Because, as far as I can imagine, uh, the so-called layman would never express it like this. And this suggests that, presumably, when investigating what kinds of um, expressions and ontological commitments exist, uh, exist in ordinary language, we have to outline what counts as ordinary language, not some kind of regimental language or influence language. Yes, you, 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 yes I, mean, I agree with a lot of that. And in fact, one of the reasons I put those sentences in Iron Deer is that I didn't, didn't want to use them for precisely those reasons. Um, I was more interested in questions like, uh, one day every now and now miserable will be happy. I assume that that is a sentence that an ordinary language speaker is probably going to understand. So there are two answers I can give you. One is, yes, we have to be very careful not to use sentences like, um, like nine or ten. Uh, sentences like, say, eight, there's no way I can jump two meters. That seems one that's less effective. I was assuming that there were a class of sentences where one could say that ordinary speakers of a language assume and agree on their truth. You have to be very, very careful not to move to sentences which, um, which uh, in fact, uh, assume this explicit metaphysics. But of course, you're also right in another way, in that it may well be that there is a metaphysics implicit in our ordinary thought, our ordinary thinking about the world. And that was linked with an answer to the previous question, because I suspect that the ordinary semantics, and here I don't mean the semantic theory of, of those of us who look at the logical structure of language, I mean that the kind of person, I know in New Zealand probably we have a a certain sort of radio interviewer is going to say, give me a yes or no answer. Is he a bad man, is he not a bad you know? And in fact, you start to say, well, in some ways yes, in some ways no, I want yes or no. And I, I actually formally believe that the ordinary nature of language is actually a nature that makes the world seem far more precise and give it far more metaphysical structure than we're really entitled to. So I've got two answers for you. One is, yes, if you are going to engage in this technique, you had better make sure that every one of the sentences you use is something that a non-philosopher would be prepared to understand and accept as true or false. And I agree with you that sentences like um, 9 and 10, particularly 10, is something where, uh, and in fact, many philosophers, I mean, Arthur Pryor, I believe, would have said nine just isn't true because I know he didn't believe in instance at any rate in the different times. Um, but he did believe that Socrates once drank him. And if you ask an ordinary person, you know, was there ever a philosopher who drank him? Well, 
they might not know, but it's not philosophical. Like, so I think in part there are certainly sentences that exhibit more, too much philosophical or semantic theory to be useful for the purposes I have in mind. And there, but there is also the danger, which I think is equally real, that ordinary sentences that ordinary speakers do understand may well be infected with more metaphysics than, than, than we are literally entitled to. Yes, it is what we are going to, what we are trying to reveal actually by investigating the language. Maybe we are after the innate, we are looking for the innate metaphysics already present in the language. Maybe this is what your proposed method or hint and method is aiming at at finding the primordial innate metaphysics underlying language. Right, and, and I suppose there's, there's, there's too much of a logical positivist in me to be comfortable with saying this, because I'm not sure that I know what this primordial metaphysics is. I know what it is to say the world cooperates with people who use a language in which quantification works like so. And therefore, in that sense, I'm happy to say, well, so and so's exist. Because if the world cooperates in a language which allows us to say, um, where if anyone who wanted to come to this lecture would have had to come to Moscow to do it. If the world cooperates in such a way that that sentence is true, then we can say there is something about the world that means we can use a language which has a structure of a certain kind, and in that sense you can say something is being revealed about what is really there, namely the world cooperates with us when we use a language in this way. But if you then say that, look, I'm, I'm a seeker after real truth or I'm whatever, then, then I will have to say, look, um, I'm not terribly comfortable with that. And for those who are not comfortable with that, I'm certainly offering something which can, I think, be read off with the aid of logical and linguistic theory. If there is some deeper sense, I guess I would, I would put the burden of proof on someone there. As I say, this probably just reveals my, reveals the fact that whatever may be within the defects of logical positivism, there is a lot of, about its aim which I find very attractive. And the positivists, remember, the logical positivists were saying, it's not that we disagree with this metaphysics, it's that we don't understand what kind of a claim is being made when somebody says this. And I'm saying, well, you can believe that, and still, in a way, do metaphysics. You'd have to do it this way. Okay, another question? I'll see you now. I just wanted to understand this part. What exactly a now operator does? Because, um, well, it is, it is uh, objectable that in many contexts now refers to the moment of the utterance, though there are other contexts where it refers to other times, but if, if we talk ontologically, someone like Pryor. I mean, Pryor didn't like to quantify over times, but if you imagine that we can quantify over times, take a sentence like, it's now four o'clock, so that the NT would really mean four o'clock is now. But of course, it's not like now, because you might say, um, it's now, it's actually a little bit past it, so although four o'clock is not now, four o'clock used to be now, in a certain sense. Now, in one sense, of course, that's in English, that's nonsense. We can't say four o'clock used to be now because only 12 minutes past four is now. But the way I was using that now operator was to say, look, 
12 minutes, I know much anyway, 12 minutes past 4 is now, 12 minutes ago, 4 o'clock was now, and that's what, that's what's meant here by the, that now predicate, because I want to say something like, it used to be now, and that's why we normally in English would say, we would, we would use the word then, but the, 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 so when we say it used to be now, in English we say it was so then. So that we are, the, the now just means whatever moment you happen to be at. And now we have an hour, now we have the 30 minutes past four. But some time ago we were, it was now, four o'clock was now in some sense of now. And now that's why. The, the predicate now in those formal languages is not exactly like the way the word now uses it in English, and I expect in many other languages. I mean, I, I, um, but logically, it simply means that if you believe in a tense language, you have to believe that there is there is a single moment that is now, but for every moment that is now, that moment will one day not be now, but it will be the case then that it used to be now. And then there will be moments that are not yet now, but one day will be now, and so on. That's the kind of language. Now, it's hard to say it in a tense language, but it's not, it's not hard to give the meaning of it. If, if you believe that sentences are true or false at moments of time, then now is a predicate that now is true of t only at time t, and now is true of t dash only at t dash, and now is true of t double dash only at t double dash. That's the way that word now is used. Um, I was using it there because one of the people, because there are philosophers who say tense is more basic than time, and therefore now is somehow real. But even those philosophers have to be able to say, and Pryor, I think, would, if he was prepared to quantify our own instance, he would be prepared to do it, I think. And in some of, some of his works, he does. He would, he would want to say, well, look, by this used to be now, I don't mean the sense in which that can't be said in any natural language, but I mean the logical sense in which every moment, every past moment, uh, used to be now, and every future in that moment will one day be now, but only one moment is now. And it's, I, you can, I think, if you're prepared to talk in a tense language, I think you can make sense of that. And I'd like to think that you can make sense of that in a way which does not presuppose the metaphysics to begin with. The moment, the, the last moment of the universe. Well, there might be a moment which is now, and there'll be no. Do you do you mean that once time has ended, there will be nothing that is even once, now or even used to be now? Yes, once well, time of the end of the existence. Well, sure. I mean, if 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 after, I mean, it depends. If you say time ends, it depends on. I mean, someone like. Well, I don't know what one what, would say. If, if, if you say that time has ended, then it, you can't really say what would happen after that, because there will be no after that. So there are no, there is nothing to be now. But that doesn't mean there is nothing now to be now. I mean, even talking about time ending, it looks like saying one day there will be no more time. But that, that, that needs a lot of unpacking so that it doesn't mean there is going to be a time at which it is not now. <laughs> when that time is now, it's not now. You've got, you've got to be careful to make sure that you don't, that you find that the formulation of that is consistent. And um, you might well say, well, of course, um, you can't 
it's even hard to say if something is now true, it's all, well, I think, I think it's always going to be that it was once true. And if you haven't said, what about when time is ended? Well, you're not really allowed to say when time is ended because that looks like a time after time is ended. So you have to be very careful to say what, what are we to say once there is no time because it's very hard not to talk about it in terms which would make it look contradictory. So you, you, I mean, I'm not saying you can't do it, but it's just that if we're talking about the ending time, I think that it's, there is certainly no bother to producing a formal language in which there is a moment such that there is no moment, no moment after. And it's true of that moment that if something is then true, there will be a moment in which it used to be true. That certainly will be. There will be some normal laws of tension logic which will fail at the last moment of time. truth at a single instant. But of course, there are certain constructions. For example, if you say, in English, we have what is called the uh, imperfective tense or the present continuous tense. We can say somebody was crossing the road. And of course, to cross the road is not something that happens at a single instant. And the semantics for the continuous present is a tricky one because we have sentences, and these have been discussed by linguists, and that one can say that, um, that um, Alice was crossing the road when she was struck, when she was hit by a bus. But then you can't say there was an interval of road crossing, at least not in the actual world. You have to say somehow there was an interval of road crossing, but not in the actual world, and it started off in the actual world. And then, there, there, and then philosophers have said, but look, we're imagining if the bus hadn't been there, and if everything had proceeded in the normal way, she would have gone across the road. But one might say, Alice was walking to her death when something happened. See, so that there, there's been a lot of work there, and I think that it's true that a lot of what I have said in this talk needs quite a lot of refinement to take care of what people have sometimes called interval semantics, where the truth of many tense constructions in natural language is going to assume that the unit of truth is not a single instant of time, but is probably a time interval. And that means that the tense logic you're going to get is going to be a great deal more complicated than anything I've got here. And I, in this paper, I have just, I suppose in this paper I have traded on the assumption that the phenomena I have been dealing with are not going to be too badly affected by the move to interval semantics. But that's perhaps a dangerous assumption for me to have made. Yes. Just a little remark, which is perhaps related to the previous question, again concerning 52 to 54. Uh, here you don't use the full power of quantification over time, because if you, you can notice that exist t goes together with nt. So there exists time t, which is now, and some phi holds. So perhaps here you, uh, a more appropriate uh, construct would be a construct from uh, what is called a hybrid logic, a construct of binder. Uh, binder. Yeah. Uh, so, so 
when we um, utter this sentence, we just uh, say, let's call the current moment of time t, just name it, and then evaluate the whole sentence in which t occurs at some points. So, so this is rather a hybrid tense logic rather than quantification over ten uh, over ten times. Yeah, I, I, there is there is a question here, and I agree with you that if you can show that natural language, that all the sentences that natural language demands can be expressed in a logic that is weaker than full quantification, then I will agree with you that then there will be the question, what should you say here? Um, one thing that does seem to be true, you're quite right here, is that the quantifier there, that the, the T that comes after now is um, paired with the, the, twee, the T in the square brackets. What would need to be shown, I, I know that many systems of hybrid logic do involve weak, uh, a weaker than full quantification. What I'm less convinced by is that the respect in which they are weaker will do everything that natural demand, natural language demands. So that the issue is not can you develop a hybrid logic that is weaker than full quantification, uh, but is this going to be good enough for everything that natural language demands? And that I'm a little bit less sure of. The other question, of course, would be, well, what The, the, the other interesting question would be, the other way of approaching it, of course, would be to start to hi with hybrid logic and look at what additional operators you're going to have to add to it before you get full quantification. And the, so that the technique would be to say, all right, let's look at the operators that you need to add to get full quantification. And then let's look at whether there are natural language which sentences which demand these operators. And that would be that would be the area where you would have to look carefully at that. Now there may be more work there than I've seen. What I what work I have seen has is often it's there is a different um, respect in which people might like to use hybrid logic, particularly logicians in the computer sciences where they might say, look, we do not want, we want languages which have the minimal logical power to do certain, certain jobs we need to do in computing. Because you can understand that if you have to pay for the power of the logic, then it's going to be cheaper to have a logic that does fewer things. And what work I've seen, and I, I, I can't pretend that I'm up to date with all the work, particularly the connection with linguistics, what work I've seen is more along the lines of for certain computational purposes, we can get a cheaper logic which doesn't do all of, of, of quantification. And that's, that's, a, uh, that's a very, very important role, I believe, for, for hybrid logic. The issue is going to be how, how cheap can your logic be to get the semantics that natural language demands? <clears throat> Uh, is there anyone who has not a asked a question, would, would want to do it? This is the time. Yes? Just uh, uh, Would you treat spatial pronouns uh, or just regular pronouns or natural language in the same uh, uh, way as you've dealt with now and other temporal things? Well, like um, here, there. Well, so, so yeah, I mean, you can certainly. I mean, in fact, it, from the point of view of pure logic, you can actually have a certain kind of indexical semantics in which your whole language is simply a propositional language, and a predicate is something true at an index, and that a, a two-place predicate is something true at a double index, and so on. Uh, we can do that. We can. 
we, it's, it's not hard to have to say the only, from the logical perspective, the only syntax we need are propositional operators and you do everything in terms of indices. And pronouns then become more like operators, certainly reflexive, that, that, that every logician loves themselves. Um, everything moves itself. There, there itself looks more like an operator which converts a, a, a transitive verb into an intransitive verb. Um, so that uh, the part of those questions are going to become much more questions for linguistics to look at how particular natural language use these things. That are, the, are the pronouns in natural language, do, they, pronouns often play a role that seems to be connected with variables, but do they play, a, play the role in the way variables uh, do, or do they play it, play it the role more like operators? And that's, that is an interesting question for the syntax of particular languages. So yes, um, I think the things that I've said, I mean, I've, 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 the things that I've said about uh, times uh, and words, where I've, I've said, look, let's look at a language in which there is no syntactic uh, quantification over times and words. We can do it for other things. And I, I, I hinted at that, and like every logician is admired by a linguist, every logician admires themselves, every so that there are a lot of things, um, whenever a cardinal meets a cardinal, he blesses him, and this kind of, these kinds of sentences, or donkey sentences, or whatever, there, there, are, there are many, many kinds of complex constructions in natural language where we can get to, we, we, we kind of know what sentence of predicate logic would represent them. But trying to get from the syntax of the natural language to the actual um, sentence of the quantificational logic is, is in fact uh, quite a tricky one. And um, pro the, the study of pronouns will come into that. I know Pryor was, was he, he had a paper called Egocentric Logic where he, um, he wanted to say that we really need a person index. And in fact, there's a famous article by David Lewis Calls they say knowledge, where he says, look, somebody thinks he's Hume. Now, to think one is Hume, I mean, only Hume think, I mean, Hume think that you could say, well, when Hume says, I think I'm Hume, he thinks Hume is Hume, but that's, that's a necessary truth. And if somebody thinks he's Hume, it's not a contradiction, because most of us who think we're human are wrong, but not all of us. Hume was right when he thought he was human, but for the rest of us, when we thought we were human, we were wrong. And Lewis says, well, think of I am Hume as a sentence that is true of Hume and false of everyone else. And is that so very different from it's nine o'clock? I mean, I can say, oh, I believe it's half past four. I believe I'm Max Grossel. I believe, it's, and, and, and Lewis tried to show how these have a very similar structure. And, and uh, John Perry had an example of somebody who says, I believe it's now nine o'clock. I believe, I believe the meeting is in 10 minutes. And one person thinks that it's, um, say the meeting is supposed to be at 10 o'clock. And one person says, I believe it's in 10 minutes. And they say this at nine o'clock. And they're wrong because they think it's nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. The other person knows that it's nine o'clock, but thinks that the meaning meaning was was shaken from nine o'clock. So you have two different sorts of, of ignorance there. So there is some evidence that perhaps we should have times and worlds and maybe people and other things. And but fr from the point of view of logic, you can think of Tarski's idea of. Think of it, the task analysis of a predicate is a formula true at a sequence of objects, namely the objects that satisfy the predicate. So from the point of view of logic, 
you can have sentences and operators, but that may or may not be a plausible syntax for any particular language. And exactly how pronouns come in um, is going to be, I would suggest, as much a syntactic as, as a logical one. Because it can be the case that the time when every individual is happy can be different. But cannot someone say, look, this formula does not demand that the time is different. It can be still the same time. Cannot someone say that this is still the representation for 44, but uh, only one particular case when this formula is true? Oh, yes. I mean, I, I don't want to make a claim about whether or not that English sentence can be uh, 46. It possibly can. Um, my claim would be that it doesn't have to. And in certain cases, I think you could say, um, take the lottery case. Um, it might have been that everyone who bought a ticket won. And I think there is a sense in which that's false. But everyone who bought a ticket might have won. Now, my claim would be that not that that English sentence has to, can't mean 46. My claim is more than surely the meaning, the question is this, is the meaning that I've highlighted in 52 a possible meaning for 44? Because if it's a possible meaning, then one will need something more than predicate logic to represent it. Now, you'd have to make a pretty strong claim that that, that meaning is just not possible, not, not is it the most natural meaning. I mean, my view about the relation between logic and, and, and is, that, is that the logical structure of the language is often going to, it's going to set limits to what in principle can be said it's then a matter for syntax to devise rules to say, look, this reading is going to be a very unnatural one. I, the other examples, the ordinary quantification examples, everybody loves someone, there is someone everyone loves. Uh, a long, long time ago, back in the 1970s, I, I tried to concoct scenarios in which um, everyone loves someone could have, you know, you set up the story so that everyone loves something. You, know, you might talk about a pop singer in this, but, you know, do you think, do you think there are some pop singers that everyone loves? Oh, everyone loves someone, you know, I mean, there, 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 there could be, if you set the thing up, so the argument would be, look, these, whether or not a natural language sentence has that meaning or naturally has that meaning is one issue. The issue for me is, is that meaning a meaning which a natural language could reasonably be expected in certain circumstances to be able to address? So that would be, but I certainly don't, yes, I, I agree with you there, I do not want to claim that 44 can never have the meaning of 46. That, that, well, and if you looked at my examples about child prodigy, like the 11 and 14, there were case, there, those were cases where both readings were logically available, but one reading seemed plausible in the case of the child prodigy example, 11, and a different reading seemed more plausible in the case of the old man reading, in the case of 14. Uh, the logic doesn't distinguish that. Now, possibly, I mean, how much of that syntax, pragmatics, whatever, there, there certainly could be, I, what branch of linguistics should address that kind of thing is certainly uh, an interesting and important question. It's a, it's a question in, in, in the nature of linguistic theory to, to what part of linguistics, if any, should tell you that 12 rather than 13 is the natural reading of 11, 
but uh, 15 rather than 16 is the natural root of 14. Is that, is that or is it not a question of linguistics? Now, I don't want to pronounce on that at all. But, um, so that, that's what I'd say about, about, about 44. Sure. Uh, I'm personally did not ask a question, and I would like to ask one. Um, um, this is a question about uh, how effective this suggestive character of language about what exists can be. Uh, we seem to be able to quantify or to use, at least use as a referential but very many, many expressions in natural language. Um, I can count 15 people in this room. And then I can count, and I, 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 I'm talking about people. Well, yes, all well, people who may say that they exist. Uh, but then we, I can also count, I can count like one and a half of a person. And then that will give me 10 one and a halves of people here. And then we can also refer to even to parts of idiomatic expressions. And I have examples like that that today are mostly Russians right in my mind right now. So, um, how suggestive is that? Uh, uh, we don't seem to accept things uh, as those parts of idiomatic expressions and uh, things like that as uh, suggestive as to what exists. But they are used as referential, or seem to be used as referential. Uh, in uh, natural language. Yeah, well, the, a couple of things. Firstly, in one way, I suppose you might say the hidden agenda of this talk is to sort of, if you like, debunk the importance of ontology. Because I think that in a certain sense, the ontological commitment of natural language is profligate and it's important that it should be so. So that, that metaphysical question, in a way, it doesn't bother me that natural language or that the underlying logical structure of language can allow many, many things. And then perhaps the metaphysical importance is not what is the domain of quantification, but what one might say, well, certain, certain things in the domain of quantification have a metaphysical importance that other things don't have. So it's not, it's not quantification or existence where it's at. It's, it's that, for example, some things in our domain of discourse are things that we humans can perceive. Middle-sized objects of a certain kind, and those are important to us. And most of our words, most of the words that, that we use in semantics are words describing people's relation to the things we can perceive, and so on. Um, but the, so that the kind of ontology that is presupposed here is very, very profitable. Now, the other question, I agree, is a much harder one. At what point can you say that the occurrence of an expression is so idiomatic that you can't derive quantification structure from it? I tried to give a kind of, I didn't, I tried to develop a series of tests where you first of all have general principles, which were like 23 up to 34, you then had certain sort of operators that allow you to transpose variables. There are, there are tests that tell you when you have enough, what logicians call them combinators, enough operators in the language to enable you to replicate uh, full quantification. And it may be that certain expressions, certain idiomatic expressions, are not ones for which natural language is going to give you a clear answer. But that doesn't bother me too much because it's like the th what I was suggesting about Vegas. I think that the semantics of natural, the, the, the nature of natural language, we actually pretend that the syntax and semantics of natural language is more precise than it is. And in particular, it may be that 
you can say, is this expression, when we look at how we use this expression, is it so idiomatic, is the range of its contents so restricted that we can't get variable binding out of the constructions in which it appears? Now, there may be a lot of borderline cases. Uh, in, 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 the, in the examples I gave you in English, sakes, there probably aren't such things as sakes because you can only do it for so-and-so's sake. All of those can never occur without uh, a genitive. And that, of course, means you can quantify. You really think of the phrase for X's sake, and the only individual is X there. That looks like that's the case. A chance of rain, that's a trickier one. Um, can you talk about the same chance? Um, but is it, is it trickier than, say, a rainbow, where is it the same rainbow that you see in ice? Can you both see the same rainbow? But we can't. What is the nature of a rainbow? Is it something we qu don't quantify over, or is it something we quantify over, but, but we all see different rainbows and so on? We can talk about the same rainbow. So that there are a lot of there are a lot of cases where the test, tests may not be precise enough, and in those cases, then we have to look at. But it, it'll be are the constructions in which the, this phrase can occur such as enable you to represent it quantification, that is to say, are the things you want to say such that whatever mechanism you use that's adequate to say is going to be a mechanism that is strong enough to define quantification. And there may be there may be more or difficult cases. Now I'm not sure whether that answered what you had in mind. It, 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 it does. Uh, are there any questions for someone who has not yet asked uh, a quick question from the state. Uh, so there is a classic example of the sentence. Uh, this sentence is not true. Uh, yeah, I think it starts kind of creepy. Yes. Uh, uh, you don't have it. Uh, it's just the sentence. This sentence is not true. Oh, uh, you mean the Yeah, the classic. Yeah. yeah. Um. It doesn't have any yeah, the, the, I haven't discussed that. I mean, in some cases, I, I once, when I did discuss it, the simplest case I could think of was, let's imagine a language in, a one, in which there is a one single sentence, and I called it kappa. And I said, I'll give you the semantics of kappa. The semantics of kappa is that kappa is a sentence, and its semantics is such that it is a sentence which is true if and only if it's not true. And my conclusion was, you cannot, that doesn't stipulate a meaning for any sentence. Because you're saying, if I was doing it in possible world terms, I was saying, V kappa means the semantic value of kappa, namely as a set of possible worlds. The semantic value of kappa is that a world W is in V kappa, if and only if, if you like, W is not in kappa. And I said there can't be any such thing. You can't, you can't assign to any sentence that meaning. Just as there can't be a set of all sets not members of themselves. Any more than there, than there can be a barber who shaves those and only those who don't shave themselves. The problem with self-referential paradoxes, and I'll take the set theory as an example, we know there can be no set of all sets not members of themselves. Why then is it a paradox? It's a paradox because there seem to us to be plausible principles that say there ought to be such a sentence. So the way to understand the paradox is to say, well, what typically people do is to say, we'd like there to be such a sentence, or we'd, we'd like there to be a set which contains those and only those things which are not links in themselves, but of course they can't be. So our set theories, which, which should give us as many sets as we can possibly have, except that. Now the problem there, I think, is why do we want this to be so? All we know for a fact is there can't be such a sentence. Or so, something. All we know for, for a fact is that there can't be a set that has as its members things that are only not members of itself. So, that are not members of 
themselves. Similarly, we can't have a sentence which is, say, four simple ingredients. Uh, we can't have a sentence that says of itself that it's false. Uh, nor is it clear that we can have a sentence that says of itself that it's true, in the sense that you can't specify what would count. Supposing you adopt the truth conditional theory of meaning and say, call the sentence capital. This sentence says of itself that it's true. What is, under what circumstances will Kappa be a true sentence? Well, it'll be a true sentence if it only if it's a true sentence. But every sentence is a true sentence if it only if it's a true sentence. So that specification, while it's not contradictory, does not uniquely give the meaning of one sentence rather than any other sentence. And if that's right, you are not giving, if you say this sentence is true, meaning it says of itself that it's true, the question is uh, why, the question is that you are not, you are not giving a specification. Now, it looks as though you are because you're making it up compositionally out of this sentence is a phrase that means something, is true seems to be something, and it looks like you're putting together things that are individually meaningful. But these paradoxical, paradoxical examples show that you can't consistently have, you're not specifying meanings, you are not completely and consistently specifying meanings when they have the consequence. So what are you doing? And that's the, the question there is, why is not how can, what can you say about this sentence is true or this sentence is false? We know that there can be no meaning specification which satisfies one, and every meaning satisfies the other, so it's not a unique one. The question then is, well, what is it that makes us think that we have specified a meaning in these cases? And then you have to look carefully at what a truth predicate looks like, what a falsity predicate looks like, what you can do, what you can't do, and so on. So I don't have a particular answer, but I'm simply saying that in these cases, we know that certain things we want to have, we can't have. And so two questions arise. One, how close can we get? And the other is a question, why do we think we should have these things? Because so the, the set theory paradox is interesting because it looks like we do want to say that there ought to be a set whose members are those and only those things which are not members of themselves. But nobody wants to say there ought to be a bar that shaves those and only those people who don't shave themselves. So the paradox is only why do we think there should be such a set? Why do we not think there needs to be such a bar? Why is the bar not a paradox? Why is the set theory a paradox? Well, it's a paradox because we have to work out why it is we think there ought to be such a set and why it is we don't think there ought to be such a bar. And the same, I think, is true of the semantic paradoxes. But I don't, in this talk, I mean, I, I have very little to say. I have no view myself about what to say about the semantic paradoxes. So the answer is yes, I, I um, I haven't said anything about the semantic paradoxes, and I don't have anything to say about them. But something has got to be said about them because they're there, and therefore they're going to be a problem for anybody's semantics. Yes. Uh, can you just quickly, well, once again, um, spell out your uh, overall uh, meta-ontological uh, stance? What about more traditional kinds of arguments appealing to scientific theories or intuitions philosophers think up? Uh, do, are they uh, legitimate at all? <coughs> well, I, I, here, here's an example. Um, nominalists seem to be people who believe only individuals exist in the process, don't they? And what would they mean by individuals? Well, one argument for nominalism would be they mean things that you can name and touch and are in, you're in sensory contact with. So I would say, no, it's, it, it's legitimate, but I would prefer to reconstruct them as saying 
that of the things we quantify over, there is a certain subclass of things which we are in sensory contact with. And what metaphysicians do might perhaps, from, from the point of view of a logical positivist, one could, a charitable logical positivist might say, what these people are really doing is highlighting the importance of a certain subclass of the things we quantify them. And that that, and that that is a legitimate task, but that's the charitableness in the logical positivism. Well, they're not really doing what they think they're doing, though they are doing something which is legitimate. And they're explaining, look, um, these are things we can actually give names to. These are things that we are in contact with. These are things which are important to us. They're giving a list of those things. So your answer, it's a yes and no answer. You're saying, am I poo-pooing traditional metaphysics? And in one sense, you could say yes, I am. But if you're poo-pooing something, you've got to, you've got to have an account of what these people are doing. If, if somebody says that such and such, the sensible world is not part of reality, then one at least has to have a good account of what somebody who says the sensible world is part of reality is saying. Um, now, of course, the positivist is not going to deny that, but if, if somebody says, well, look, um, uh, there are no numbers, but there are people, uh, one might say, well, look, uh, and Carnap, I think, might say something like this, look, one could elect to say, I am not going to use the number language, but I'm going to use the person language. And if I agree to use the per if I agree that I'm not going to use the number language, the question is, can I say all the things I want to say? Uh, if somebody says that persons exist but numbers don't, and that person says, nevertheless, I'm going to use the number language, but and I'm going to use the person language. But I say the person language has a reality that the number language doesn't. That's a little bit. It seems very easy to say, well, aren't you simply saying, look, we can use the number language and the person language, but we're attaching a certain kind of importance or reality to the person language that we're not attaching to the number language, which is rather like saying, persons are important to us in a way in which numbers are not. Persons have all sorts of things which are crucial for our language in, in, in that we say, well, we can interact with them, we can do these things with them. So there would be a role for metaphysics, but the role would be, well, look, now I'm not now talking here about the reply that I gave before. The reply that I gave before was, look, you metaphysicians may talk your talk, but we positivists don't understand what you're saying. I'm thinking about the charitable positivist who hears the metaphysicians talk and say, look, they seem to be engaged in a language game in which they rules. They seem to be doing something sensible. How can I, consistent with my positivist principles, charitably construe what they're doing? Well, I can say they're attaching a certain kind of reality or importance to these things that they're not attaching to these things. But all right, I'm prepared to understand their word real. To me, it's just a predicate that's true of some things but not others, but I can understand what they say when they say people are real but numbers are not. Um, real is the predicate they apply to people but don't apply to numbers. Now, I, I, I quantify both these things, but I can understand a predicate which applies only to people and not to numbers. Um, and that's what I understand them to be doing. So that would be the kind of reply that would at least allow me to, for example, supposing I was a logical positivist, but was interested in the history of philosophy. And I wanted to describe the um, medieval debate between um, the realists and the nominalists. Obviously, I got to be able to make sense of what they were debating about in some sense. And it is, of course, difficult. I mean, this is one of the things of why we say, oh, what there is.
talks about how the person who doesn't believe in certain things is a disadvantage at the person who does, because the person who does can just say, well, I believe in all these kind of things. And if you say, I don't believe in all these kind of things, it's very hard to say what sort of thing you don't believe in. So um, I'm happy to say there is the language, there is the, the uh, language framework in which we make this decision. Carnap does. Carnap does say we can have universals in our language. We can. Carnap does claim I know what it is like to use a language in which there are universals, and I think it's unique, and, and, and I think it's a useful language. Now, maybe the dispute between universe between realists and nominalists is really a dispute about whether we ever need the more powerful language, whether it's profitable to have the more powerful language. That may have been Carnap's dispute, or it may be to say, well, look. I believe that we quantify over both things, and I look at one group of people who uses the word real in this restricted way, and another group who doesn't. And it looks like they are debating there, but then is it a real debate? So Carnot would probably say it's not a genuine debate in some sense. But yes, you're right, we have got to make sense of what people are doing who think there is a debate where we might say there is no debate. We've got to be able to describe what it is they think they're doing, even if it's not something we know. So yeah, you've got to, um, and I, I give it some suggestions, but yes, it's a real problem what you do in describing what people are doing when they are engaged in the metaphysical dispute, which you're inclined to think is not a genuine dispute. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Professor Creswell. Uh, I guess uh, we will end our session for today. Thank you. Thank you.